third section, the military and democratic Latin America after the Cold War. First subsection, uh, military exit strategies and the reduction of budget and personnel. By the mid 90s by the mid 1990s, elected democratic rule was well established in nearly Latin American, in, in nearly all Latin American countries. With the exception of Colombia, guerrilla movements had been reintegrated in society. In Central America, three bloody civil wars were concluded after elaborate peace agreements. Simultaneously, all dictatorial military regimes had been succeeded by elected uh, civilian governments. Outgoing military governments arranged their own transitional pacts by, for instance, by maintaining their military functions of command, like they did in Peru, or by preserving their influential cabinet positions, like in Brazil and in Guatemala, military hardliners maintained substantial influence behind the scenes by controlling national intelligence. Chilean dictator Pinochet remained commander-in-chief of the armed forces and took a senatorial seat for life. That all meant a kind of co-governance in the shadows of power. But eventually, former military dictators felt in disgrace or were imprisoned. The final outcome was a significant reduction in terms of political influence accompanied by sharp cutbacks in terms of budget, personnel, and equipment. The transition implied also the loss of the de facto monopoly on intelligence matters. In general, it was a process of gradual but controlled conversion of the military in military, the, the military politicians in military professionals. At present, military expenditure is the highest in Brazil. This country spends nearly 45% of all defense spending in the region. Current military security doctrines in Brazil focus on the re-equipment and modernization of the three branches of the armed forces and in geopolitical terms, Brazil gives priority to its sovereignty and effective control over the Amazon basin, including its national resources and its biodiversity, and to the protection of its shorelines and the old resources in the subsoil in uh, its, its continental shell. Place two, three, and four is for Colombia, Mexico, and Venezuela. These four countries spend around 75% of the total military budget in the region. My second point of the military in democratic Latin America, the popularity, the remaining popularity of military leaders. Paradoxically you now, the Latin American electorate maintains a weak spot concerning soldiers in politics. The last 25 years, one can distinguish three tendencies. First, the election of former conservative dictators a military strongman has airbrushed Democrats. Secondly, the nostalgic potential for the coup, and particularly in Venezuela, the redefinition of the military roles is political army in support of elected reformist government. And then I'll give some examples. In 1998 in Bolivia, for example, the former dictator Banzer made a political comeback to the ballot box. Former Guatemalan dictator Rios Mon won the municipal elections in 1993, and more interesting, even in the villages of the indigenous widows, and was invested with the presidency of the National Congress after the presidential elections of 1999. In Peru, the military backed the self group of elected President Fujimori in 1992. In Guatemala, 1993, a similar coup intended by President Serrano was initially backed by the armed force, but it failed. In 1996, Paraguayan General Oviedo, who previously had expelled dictator Sosner, attempted to overthrow the successor civilian government. The coup effort failed due to public demonstrations and the rumors about a possible uh, intervention by Brazil 
and sanctions of the OAS. In 1997, in Ecuador, the military supported a kind of civilian coup of the parliament against President Bukharin, who afterwards was declared mentally ill. Then, in 2009, the Honduran military staged the coup to, to remove elected President Zelaya, who flirted with the idea of an alliance with Cuban and Venezuelan politics. The coup was in a strictly military center success, but resulted in a political disaster. All member states of the OAS reacted with dismay. The appointed interim government became a regional area and had to organize new elections. In all cases I mentioned here, there were in fact exceptions. In general, the Latin American armed forces opted for non-political positioning. In Brazil, in 2016, when the government party characterized the ongoing impeachment procedure against President Rousseff as a coup, the armed forces invited to, by the press to take a stance, clearly refused to give opinions. It was a political issue, not a military one. Captivating is the spectacular emerging of former Lieutenant Governor, uh, Colonel Hugo Chavez. In 1992, Chavez, a long life devotee of Simon Bolivar and, and an admirer of the president's, uh, the, the progressive president, Velasco and Torricos, staged a coup that failed. But when he was released from jail, he founded a political movement. Cuban diplomats who monitored his career stood as bystander in the villages during his campaign. And when they heard the Venezuelan villagers saying, the Messiah has come, I want to touch the Messiah, they were convinced that he could be the next president. Then he was invited to visit Cuba, and it was the beginning of an enduring personal and political friendship with Fidel Castro. During the 15 years of Chavez presidency, from 1999 to 2013, this political trajectory and his legislation demonstrated a deepening radicalization. Chavez eventually founded his own political party. The new constitution of 1999 established the Bolivarian on the Republic of Venezuela. In 2000, the reform plan Bolivar was launched managed by the armed forces. After a failed coup in 2002, <laughs> President Chavez purged the armed institutions, and they were complemented by popular militias and special assistance groups of student workers in the lives created to resist a possible uh, American invasion. Chavez and Castro cemented the relation by a mutually beneficial agreement with human doctors literacy trainings and educational uh, experts went to Venezuela uh, in benefit of the pro poor program, so-called missions, uh, and Cuba received only the deficits of 90,000 barrels per day at preferential rates. Each mission has its special head, its special budget, uh, shrinking, special administration, special management, and many armed forces, are rec many armed officers are recruited as managers, and all missions are special task force under the direct authority of the presidency. My third point, new missions in, in democratic Latin America, and new structures in democratic Latin America. In the new context of democratic elections and the civilian rule, it also implied the need for the redefinition of military missions. It reinforced the overall tendency toward conventional, non-political professionalism. The Latin American government and the military leaders sought new roles for an altered national, regional, and global security environment. These missions referred to environment, environmental issues, protection of the biodiversity, acting as key actors in civil defense, and assistance in case of natural disasters. Participation in peace mission became a preferred new role. Military contingents of many Latin American countries participated in peace missions operating under United Nations mandate. 
These missions are continued to the present. From 2004 on, Brazil and Chile headed the UN Stabilization Mission in Haiti. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Peru created as well peacekeeping shoes for our military. In 2008, in 2008, the new institution, the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR and its Spanish acronym, was created in rivalry with the Inter-American Defense Board, the government body of the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, a South American Defense Council was created. In April 2015, UNASUR founded its own Escuela Sur America de Defensa, South American Defense School, as antithesis to the former School of the Americas in the then American Canal Zone. The Secretary General of the Board, former Colombian President Ernesto Sandro, declared that the South American Defense School is committed to develop its own doctrine aiming at ensuring peace.